Okay. So, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, for those of you play, playing um, presentation cliche bingo, you'll be pleased to know that I'm about to say I'm the only thing between you and lunch. So, those of you with a row or a house, shout now. Um, I think the time is... Yeah, if... if well, hopefully we can wrap up by, by, by one with this, or, or five, five to one. I was asked to talk about research data management and UK funding policies. Um, in my former role, I was the program manager for the GIST Managing Research Data Program, so we were doing a lot of work in that context with particular universities. Indeed, Manchester um, has a project at, or had a project um, in the latest, in both programs, in fact, and the I2S2 project that did the um, the scientific life cycle, which you saw, was, was one of the projects in the, in the program as well. But since I got the, inf the kind invitation from Brian to, to speak here, I've, I have changed roles to become an executive director in Codata. So I'll talk a little bit in the, in the presentation about the UK funding policy uh, uh, context, um, a little bit about data publication, because I thought that might be of a, uh, an area of interest to this audience, and then um, mention some of the things that... Um, or a couple of things that uh, are going on in Codata at the moment, and really to try and throw out some questions, you know, what can Codata um, do for you? I have to say I feel slightly vulnerable with this audience because I have the impression often that crystallography has got its house very much in order. So speaking in general terms about high-level policies and aspirational policies, which are very important for many areas of research and, and, and science, to crystallographers, um, sometimes makes one feel exp exposed. But there have been things uh, said this morning which make me understand, I think, that some of these issues about the data publication, associating data with, uh, with published work, with articles, still aren't entirely correct what type of data should be so thus associated. So perhaps there are um, issues we can, we can discuss in that way. Um, a generic slide really about the sort of the drivers for a research data policy directions, what sort of uh, drivers are coming um, from research communities themselves that should be, should be stressed and from research funders. Um, why are we talking about the availability of research data um, a lot at the moment? Um, there, is, there is pressure from research funder policies, from legislative frameworks. Um, the open data agenda is very much in pushing in this uh, direction. Um, I think we should remember also that there's some minority, but a very vocal minority of researchers who are actively calling for open data because it's good research practice and because those researchers, whether they're um, data experts, data scientists, or uh, researchers in general, um, want to get their hands upon the data which is produced by their particular communities so it can be analyzed and integrated um, uh, and, and used for further, for further research. So there is a core principle that the outputs of publicly funded research should be publicly available. I think that's a core principle we can, we can buy into. And it is good research practice. The evidence underpinning research findings um, should be available for validation. This is the, reproducibi the validation and the reproducibility of science and research. And there is also a wager, and it's probably a good one, that um, research funders can get a greater return on investment through the availability and the reuse of research data. Within the Managing Research Data Program, the work we do with the Digital Curation uh, Center, we often argue as well that good data management is good for research. It's the sort of thing you learn in graduate school. Name your files properly. Put them in the right place. Back them up. Don't lose them. How do you find the file that you are looking for? Um, a, a, a cliche which is sometimes rolled out, but I think a true one is that the first person with whom you share your research data is often your future self. You need that, you know, you need good labeling um, for your own practice, let alone for sharing data with other people. And increasingly, um, the good management of research data and the archiving of research data aligns very much with university missions to provide an excellent research infrastructure. I'll go into that a bit more detail when we come on to the EPSRC uh, research data policy. So there is also pressure on funders from government and from universities, therefore, to have a better oversight of the research outputs which are produced in their, uh, their university for things like the REF, but also for, for demonstrating impact of their activities. And 
partly under pressure from all these drivers and from researchers themselves that are moved from some journals and learned societies, I should have said learned societies, not just learned, uh, towards policies uh, for the availability of the data underpinning, underlying, providing the evidential base for the article in question. And I think there's, there remain some issues of terminology and definition about what sort of data we're talking about precisely then. So one of the big statements in, in recent times about this is the Royal Society uh, uh, Science as an Open Enterprise Report. It started off as the Science as a Public Enterprise Report when it was in the committee stage and changed its name to Open, which I think was significant. And setting out to look at the state of uh, science and research in the 21st century and how science needed to adapt to new technology it ended up almost becoming a single message report, which was, it's all about open data. They made that decision through the committee process to really focus in on open data, and I think that's significant as well. They came up with a definition of intelligent openness, which they defined as uh, data should be accessible, you can get at it, accessible, you've got some idea of the provenance and the, the validity of it, the... Um, to what extent you can rely on it, the quality of the data, I should say. Um, it's got to be intelligible, you can understand it, and it's got to be usable and reusable. And this requires a number of things around that data in terms of its description and its, its quality. And they argue as a first step towards this intelligent openness that the data that underpin, and again we can argue about the definitions of this, but the underpin a journal article should be made concurrently available in an accessible database, and we can do this now. This is, this is possible. They also define six key changes which they want to see happen in the, in the practice and the support of, of research. Um, a shift away from the research culture where data is viewed as a private um, preserved, the, uh, the, the data mining in the sense of keeping it mine rather than, and that's, I should acknowledge that to Carol Goebel, um, rather than um, share, sharing um, more publicly as, a, as an output of research, just as a, a research article is an output of research. And thereby to expand the criteria um, used to evaluate research and to give credit and reward, career reward, acknowledgement when a researcher or a research team make their data available um, as part of, uh, the, the, of scholarly communication. And all this requires things like uh, common standards for communicating the data, increasing the number of skilled people, of data scientists, and uh, the development of new software tools. But also this mandating of intelligent openness for data that's related to scientific papers. But we should perhaps not... Um, limit ourselves to that because a lot of useful data is made as a reference and which has more uses than just the, the, uh, the scientific paper that it might underpin. So I wanted to mention some of the inter uh, international dimensions to um, these data policy directions before going on to some of the specific UK policies. Um, a lot of the research funder policies are based largely on the OECD principles, which um, Codata at the time had some input into. Um, and you know, this general principle that the outputs of fun publicly funded research should be publicly available. And this relates to the o open access agenda as well. Increasingly, US funders are requiring um, data management plans in the case of the NSF and there's... Uh, the OSTP memorandum, which required um, U.S. funders to, make, uh, to, to put in place plans for, by which they would um, support and ensure the availability of um, outputs from their research programs, including um, the research data. Um, the EC will be including, as its Horizon 2020, the requirement for some of the strands, at least, of that program, um, the preparation of a data management plan. There's a good blog post about the recent public consultation, and I was involved in a, um, a workshop organized by the Leibniz um, in Institute, which was advising directly on uh, which strands uh, data management plans should be uh, used for. Our advice was for all, because data management planning is an important part of the research process and the uh, research planning process, even if, and arguably especially if, the data can't be released at the end because of privacy or commercial 
um, reasons. Um, but we'll see what, to, to what extent they take that advice on board. And, of course, there's the G8 uh, minute, science minister's statements as well, which argues for um, availability of research data to address global challenges um, and argues for the need for global research data, stressing um, that a significant um, function of that global research infrastructure would be to facilitate open access to research data where appropriate. So move on briefly to um, the UK research uh, funder principles. Um, you're probably f a lot of people are probably fairly familiar with the RCUK one, so I probably don't need to labour them a great deal. There are a set of high-level principles, and they're, they're, they're pretty well constructed. I think they start off with that point, uh, the, the public good, moving on to the need to preserve research data when, when necessary and the need to provide um, access and discoverability. Um, they make due... Uh, allowance for those cases where it may not be possible or appropriate to share research data. For example, if, um, if private individuals are identified, for example, if there are commercial interests um, at play. They also allow that within certain scientific cultures there may be a need for an embargo and for the, the right of first use, but they push back a little bit on that and, and argue for them um, open by by def default and stress that those embargo times shouldn't be excessively long. And the important thing that um, data users should acknowledge data sources and um, researchers should get recognition and reward for sharing their research data. Now, what I want to discuss a little bit here is a shift which happened in the, in the in the last year or so, well, a couple of years now, really, due to the um, EPSRC research data policy expectations. Now, hitherto, um, most of the UK research councils were re regarded the, ma the maintenance and funding of, da of data centres as part of their responsibility, but there's been a little bit of a shift away from that, and I think, in general, research funders are reluctant to fund data infrastructure in the long term term as a, as, a, as a sort of continued uh, part, part of their resource. There may be some questions about that, but I think you know, we, we have to think seriously about what sustainability models we can find for data centers and, and the data infrastructure. And certainly the sign from the EPSRC is that um, there may be case for uh, data resources in particular areas, but by and large, they consider the provision of the data infrastructure to be a responsibility of research organizations, from the most part universities or research institutes. And this is because they consider that just as a university provides its local network, its computing facilities, some of the facilities by which the experiments are conducted, and the computers, and the library, and their own archive, they should also provide a data, uh, a data center and a data facility, and it's a university responsibility. And part of the argument here at least is relatively sound in that most of the universities that exist at the moment, we can rely on to carry on existing, and certainly the big ones and the research-intensive ones. Um, research uh, databases and research data archives don't necessarily have such um, a long life and as a, a reliable a sustainability plan. This is something we really need to address, but in the meantime, we can see universities picking up a significant amount of the slack in this. And so there's a number of expectations upon, that the EPSRC um, puts upon researchers and research institutions, one of which is to, uh, to maintain a public catalogue of the data holdings with metadata and a permanent identifier. And they do require that the metadata, at least, if not the data itself, should be uh, made publicly available within a year of the data um, creation. And again, this sort of constant theme that the uh, data associated with publication should be made um, available. So this, when these were released, it set the cat among the pigeons, not least because the EPSRC wrote letters to vice chancellors directly, um, and they were required to have a roadmap in place by uh, the 1st of May 2012, and to be compliance, at least in terms of EPSRC uh, dipstick testing by um, the 1st of May. This um, gave a big sort of impetus to some of the work that um, we were doing then in, um, with, with JISC in the second iteration of the Managing Research Data Program. And we really turned that program to focus intensely upon what an institution would need to 
comply with EPSRC, uh, EPSRC uh, requirements and to put in place a research data management infrastructure within that institution. Um, I'm not going to go into that in a great deal, but the sort of things that all the, the projects in the program um, had to develop were a data policy for the institution, a set of training materials for researchers and for the data support staff, the data librarians, a pilot repository and a metadata system and a catalogue. And these sort of things have been put in place, at least in pilots, and some of them, the institutions that were more advanced, um, having been involved in the first programme as well, like Southampton and like um, Manchester and like Oxford, have made significant progress, I think. So the question, where should research data go from various research disciplines? There are various op options, but there are, we are facing, I think, a complex um, research data uh, ecosystem. The institutions will pick up some responsibility. There are also these uh, journal-related uh, data repositories like Dryad, and I should stress that I'm involved uh, very much with the the Dryad initiative on, on their board of directors ad, ad, advising them. There are also the national disciplinary data centers which are very um, well established and the international disciplinary data set, uh, networks or things like the Protein Data Bank but also the data centers which are part of the um, uh, ICSU world data system. So this developing this uh, ecosystem and making sure that it's sustainable is going to be a big challenge um, going forward of course. So I wanted to say something uh, a little bit about the, the Dryad initiative because I think it points to this, um, I suppose, a change in research culture that is both emerging and that we're trying to engineer, if you like, um, in order to encourage the greater availability of, um, of, of research data. I like this piece from um, Todd Vision because it presents, I think, a very plausible and persuasive vision of how um, research should, should be conducted. It argues that the, the scholarly uh, communication process is, is a, a form of a social contract by which researchers put towards their peers and, and, and the public in general their, their intellectual endeavours and in, in return get criticism and career re reward. And this process should be extended to um, research data. Um, and Dryad seeks to do this by providing a model for how a disciplinary re repository can motivate researchers to disclose the data that is of greatest value for scientific reuse uh, that associated with publications. Now, John mentioned earlier the downloads of the data from, um, that, that, that had been uh, deposited. So Dryad, like a number of the other, other of these initiatives, does track the number of downloads of the data, and hopefully that can be uh, taken as part, in, in the future, taken as part of the, um, the way in which researchers measure their research impact. How, how often has your article been cited? How often, indeed, has your data been cited, downloaded, reused, etc.? <clears throat> so I'll move on to some of the other um, policy directions that, that, that are emerging. Moving on from that argument, uh, uh, or th from the example of Dryad, um, a number of journals are, well, have had for some time, but the number of journals that have data policies is increasing um, o over, the, over the past few years. Uh, uh, about a year and a half to two years ago, all the, biomed uh, uh, all the BMC journals um, uh, developed a, a data policy. Um, as part of the GIST Managing Research Data Program, we funded a project called JORD, which um, did a survey of um, existing journal data policy. And they found that roughly 50% uh, of the journals sampled had a data policy of some sort or other. But they also found that some of these were very loose, uh, could not be uh, classic characterized as strong. They were more encouraged than required. And also there was perhaps more, you know, just as importantly at least, a lot of the policies were relatively vague about where the data should be uh, deposited, what standards should be used, what sort of embargoes um, were appropriate. So I think there's need within the research community and with, uh, with, with journals that, that res in, in which researchers uh, publish to define and harden the, uh, the data availability policies and to make them more helpful, to be frank, to make them more um, directive in the sense of where should particular data types go, what are the appropriate uh, repositories, what standards should be used. This may 
apply less to crystallography where the standards are um, uh, very well defined, but it certainly applies to a lot of research areas. Another project that, we, uh, that, that I've been working with as part of the GIST Management Research Data Programme was the Prepared Project, and I thought it might be of, of interest to um, some of these, uh, to, to, to some people in this um, workshop. Um, it was a project that looked at a number of aspects and processes related to data publication and the association of data sets with published articles. Looking at the workflows, we saw a number of the workflows that are used by the IUCR uh, journals uh, d demonstrated earlier, and I did, it did make me wonder to myself to what extent the prepared project um, had, had looked at uh, the IUCR journals, and I fear they may not have done, which uh, will, will mean slap rests. But they, they produced a number of these workflows for, they're, they're working really with um, the geospatial data journal um, produced by Wiley, and they, they took in a number of other examples as well. So they've done a report on publication process and the workflows that are used in a number of research areas. Um, they're also interested in repository accreditation. So what makes a repository a good and appropriate repository? What sort of things does a repository have to do to be a reliable and trusted digital repository? There are various definitions of that. But for the purposes of this sort of data publication, um, they, they've, they are developing a white paper on principles of repository accreditation, which will be released. And they've also looked at the processes of um, scientific review and peer review of, of, uh, of data sets. And again, that's an area where I think it may be possible for them to learn from uh, crystallography. And we'll be um, publishing a white paper on that um, in the early autumn, I think. And something that they're very interested in are the mechanisms for cross-linking between data sets and uh, published articles so that researchers can, can follow these links in both directions, um, which really w was what uh, motivated my question earlier to Erica. Two minutes. Okay. So, key research data challenges. This is going to sound very much like pointing out the obvious and, and, and high level, but it may nevertheless be worth stating as a result of these policy drivers and a result of the change in the way research is being conducted. Um, we need to move to a culture where research data, by and large, is open by default, but to develop better clarity about the limits of openness. Um, we need to think about developing and sustaining the data infrastructure and have more policies about standards and data resources. I'll skip through those a little bit because I want to take, say a little bit in the last two minutes about um, CoData. So CoData's mission is to strengthen international science for the benefit of society, and it's important to stress that uh, mission being for the benefit of society by improved scientific um, uh, scientific and technical data management and use. Um, I'll mention this CoData strategic plan, which has three elements. Um, but really, it's all about CoData providing a leadership role and doing so through acting within a very strong uh, community, because it's through that community and that membership community, the engagement with the national membership and with the scientific unions, that CoData as an organization can articulate um, an influential authoritative voice based upon the expertise of its members. The strategic plan for the next um, five years, um, as I say, has three elements. One, working on policy frameworks, so pulling together these national and international policy uh, directions. Um, and really as a community wanting to take um, a lead in defining the policy agenda for scientific data. And the key mechanism for doing this will be um, a data policy committee which is being uh, established. The second area of the strategic activity um, is, t is uh, to look at the frontiers of data science and technology and really to explore what is new and what is essential um, in data science if research is going to adapt to the new parameters, the new, um, the new data flows, the new way in which um, data is being created and the high speeds, the high flows, etc. Um, there's a number of areas that um, we do this, partly through the conference, partly through the data science journal, which we intend to reinvigorate, partly through the established task groups and the more ad hoc working groups uh, that we, we work with. And also we intend to do that through a series of, of workshops over the next few years, to which... Um, Again, drawing on that community of expertise, which we think an organization like Codata can, um, can articulate. 
And then finally, the third element of the strategic plan is to work very closely with ICSU and their um, scientific um, uh, programs. So, for example, the Integrated Research on Disaster Risk is an area of, of, of activity, and the new um, ICSU program on, on, on Future Earth will be in, involved with it, advising on data elements there. So I think this is the last thing that I'll mention about, about, um, uh, about CODED. I just wanted to flag a forthcoming report from one of the task groups um, which is, has had a four-year life and um, will be producing what, what I think will be a very influential and important report called Out of Sight, Out of Mind, I like the title, really setting out um, a forceful set of first principles on data citation. And we hope that that will persuade a lot of researchers and uh, journals that really data citation is an essential part of good practice in the communication of research. So um, some of this was mentioned already by, by John, but um, really wanted to end on what can CoData do for you? How can CoData work with the International Union of Crystallography and with the expertise in this um, room? I'll not go into the, the data space being a crowded area, but if anyone wants to ask me how we intend to work with WDS and RDA, I'll be happy to discuss that in conversation. Um, it does strike me that crystallography and the data model that you use is a very good um, model that can be extended or at least um, used as a, as, a, as a point of reference by other research areas. I think there's work to be done in that area. And I'd also like to understand you know, what are the on ongoing data issues in crystallography and, and what, in, to what extent can engagement with an organization with co-data with experts from other fields of research help in um, unpicking some of those data issues. Sorry for overrunning a bit. Thank you very much. Yeah,